Hello and welcome everyone to the 27th episode. Today is going to be a lot of fun, because I'm going to tell you the story of the Mesozoic Era, the Age of Reptiles, where dinosaurs dominated the Earth. This era is split into three periods, called the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous, which I'm sure you know by heart if you were enthusiastic about dinosaurs as a kid. In the previous episodes covering the evolutionary history of life on Earth, I began with the three billion year long Precambrian era, where the Earth was formed, the boiling oceans cooled, and life arose in the form of single celled organisms. Then I covered the nearly 300 million year Paleozoic era, where life spread out to cover the surface of the Earth, creating new ecosystems with woody plants and huge insects, and the first ancestors of the reptiles and amphibians and mammals. These primitive tetrapods grew larger to fit their environment, only for 70% of them to be destroyed, along with 97% of marine species, in the horrible Permian-Triassic extinction event. This event was also called the Great Dying, and it ushered in the Mesozoic Era, which began with the Triassic period. The world's landmass was still organized into the supercontinent Pangaea, although from this point on, the continents would begin to slowly break apart and over the next 250 million years, they would move into the places they are today. But in the Triassic, Pangaea was the world. It held vast expanses of continental land that saw huge temperature fluctuations, from savage cold in the winter to the brutal heat of the summer. Along the coast of Pangaea, the water modulated the climate and kept the temperatures from reaching extremes. But this difference between coastal and inland temperatures led to heavy storms and monsoons, and so life struggled for tens of millions of years deep into the mid-Triassic as it tried to recover from the great dying and the storms that perpetually blasted all the livable areas of the world. After this cataclysmic event 252 million years ago, the Earth was pretty much scourged. The climate was radically altered, and entire ecosystems had been thoroughly destroyed as plant and animal species and all sorts of niches went extinct. The largest animals of the late Paleozoic era were almost entirely wiped out, and much of the marine life was killed off by low oxygen content in the oceans and the high temperatures. There is significant geological evidence suggesting that the Earth was barren and particularly brutal during this time. For example, when large quantities of plant biomass grow and die, and grow and die over and over again, the tissues accumulate on the forest floor faster than they can be broken down. Over geologic time spans, sediment and rock cover up these massive decomposing forests, and the pressure compresses the biomass into coal. There are coal deposits throughout geologic time, particularly from the early Carboniferous period, when there weren't any microbes to break down the lignin in the plant tissue. So with that said, there are virtually no coal deposits that have been found in the soils of the early Triassic, which suggests that there was relatively little plant biomass available. So stark is this total lack of coal that geologists literally call it the coal gap. Fossilized riverbeds also give clues to the aridity and barrenness of the time period. When a river flows through a region with dense vegetation, the roots of all the plants and trees help hold the ground together creating clumps of dense earth that the water flows around. And this creates a river that flows like a ribbon of water. It's a continuous stream, and it gracefully meanders its way through the landscape. But when there aren't any plants, there's no extensive root systems holding the soil together. The mineral topsoil can be easily washed away by rain or floods, which then accumulates in rivers that become thick with sediment. This, in addition to the erodible banks and flood surfaces of ground with no plant roots, breaks up meandering rivers and turns them into braided rivers, or rivers composed of many small streams overlapping and intersecting. Fossils of riverbeds from the early Triassic are mostly braided, which suggests that this barren, plant-devoid type of landscape was pretty common across most of the Earth's surface. The marine and terrestrial animal species that survived the extinction event stabilized their populations around 5 to 6 million years into the Triassic. They made new ecosystems, which were at first small and rudimentary, composed of only a handful of surviving species and their immediate descendants. These ecosystems wouldn't fully recover until nearly 30 million years into the Triassic. The extinction event sculpted life in the oceans dramatically, making some body plans and species behaviors more advantageous and others less so. For example, selection pressures promoted movement, as species like snails and crabs outcompeted the more stationary species of filter feeders. 
This was most likely due to the fact that plant life had become rare, which diminished the populations of species that ate plants for food. This effect went up the food chain, shrinking populations as they starved for lack of sufficient prey. Those organisms who were stationary could only eat what came near them. If they weren't exposed to enough food, that was it. There's nothing they can do. They starved. This would have put a selection pressure on organisms that could move, that could squirm or swim or crawl around. These mobile critters would be able to seek out food on their own, and in this way, they could avoid starvation. For much of the early Triassic, life in the oceans was a disaster. As huge swaths of the marine community had been rendered extinct, stable ecosystems were a thing unheard of. The massive coral reefs that had characterized the sea in the Devonian period were now, in the Triassic, nothing more than small patches of coral, shameful parodies of the reefs that they once were. Of the few species that survived the Great Dying, many would go on to fill the emptied oceans through diversification and speciation. This would include the ammonites, which were larger cephalopods that bore massive curving shells, with their tentacle-covered face protruding out from the bottom. It also includes a variety of aquatic reptiles, typically uh, the long-tailed serpent-like creatures with paddles or broad hands that are adapted for swimming, including the placidon, the plesiosaur, and the viciously successful ichthyosaurs. These ichthyosaurs were really no joke. They were massive predators with huge bodies and powerful fins, made all the more deadly by a freakishly long snout that was just lined with teeth. The ichthyosaurs are terrifying beasts, like some eldritch combination of a reptile and a shark. The ichthyosaurs are now extinct, but their lineage spent a good 150 million years or so hunting through the Mesozoic oceans. Large plants were mostly wiped out by the Great Dying, so those species that clung to the surface were smaller and hardier, able to endure the droughts and other tough environmental conditions present at the time. Some of these early plants include the ginkgo, ferns, and horsetails. Seed plants, like seed-bearing ferns and conifers, came to dominate the landscape. Vast forests of conifers carpeted the more moderate regions of the world, and they reached as far as the North and South Poles. During this time period, the world was really, really hot, and it's believed that there wasn't any ice on the poles at all. In fact, the polar regions were believed to have been so warm that the temperate forests there were thriving ecosystems, home to even a few species of reptile. Reptiles in general dominated the entire Mesozoic period, including the Triassic. Amphibians are a particularly fragile group of creatures, and when the climate and ecosystems changed so drastically during the Great Dying, many species of amphibian failed to keep up. A huge majority of the amphibians dwelling on land were just totally wiped out, with various species of reptile coming in to fill their emptied niches. Almost all of the surviving amphibian species were aquatic or semi-aquatic, preferring coastal regions, swamplands, marshes, lakes, rivers, and open ocean. Amphibian species continued to go extinct throughout the early Triassic, with only a handful able to make it into the Cretaceous. Understand that when I'm talking about these amphibians, I'm not really talking about your cute little salamanders or tree frogs. I'm talking massive, hulking monsters with slimy skin and broad, flat skulls. Some of these amphibians, species like the Mastodonsaurus, could grow more than a dozen feet long. So these things are huge. They're just like slimy, wet versions of giant reptiles. A few species of reptile thrived in the early Triassic, only to die out before the period came to an end. Such species include the large Rhynchosauruses, which as far as we can tell, looked sort of like giant mole rats. They were basically large, hairless reptiles with broad, lumpy heads and mouths tipped with two massive fangs, close together like rat fangs, but a little bit longer. These teeth were broad, kind of like plates, and instead of being used to eat meat, the Rhynchosaurs used them to strip leaves from plants. They had teeth lining the roof of their mouths, which helped them tear up plant tissue for digestion. These rhynchosaurs were, for a brief period between 240 and 220 million years ago, the most common large grazing herbivores on the planet, growing up to 2 meters in length, and they were everywhere, in almost every habitat. But they died out as they were eventually outcompeted by more specialized species. Other reptiles were able to persist, lasting for much longer than the mid-Triassic, creating lineages that lasted deep into the Jurassic or the Cretaceous periods. Some of these were the archosaurs and the theropods. 
The archosaurs are the ancestors of both birds and crocodiles. They were much like the crocodiles of today, with long snouts lined with socketed teeth, and a thick midsection and heavy tail supported by short, scaly legs, and a preference for semi-aquatic habitats like rivers, marshes, and coastal lowlands. The theropods were predatory reptiles, but for much of the Triassic, they would remain relatively small and confined to lurking through the underbrush. The theropods were predatory reptiles, you know, they were carnivores, but for much of the Triassic, they would remain pretty small, and they didn't do much else besides lurk around in the underbrush. A non-reptilian group called the Kynodonts appeared during the Permian period, but they survived the Great Dying to recover and thrive in the Triassic. These Kynodonts are the ancestors of mammals, and they were unique from the reptiles in that they had bodies covered in fur, with legs that stood up straighter for better locomotion and motility, and a warm-blooded circulatory system. These early Kynodonts were relatively small. They had the shape of a really squat, hairless dog, or like a lizard mixed with a dog. They had mammalian heads, with bulging brain cases and large zygomatic arches under their eyes, as sites of attachment for the jaw muscles. And they had tails that were either narrow or thin, unlike the bulkier tails of their reptilian cousins. The Kynodonts were pretty small, because they suffered from hard competition with various reptiles. This competition with the predatory archosaurs pushed the Kynodonts into the shadows, ecologically speaking, forcing them to eat insects and adapt a metabolism to match their small bodies. So all of these reptiles, as well as the amphibians and the mammals, and all the plant life of the time, all of this life was hit headfirst by the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event that took place about 200 million years ago. The world's ecosystems had only fully stabilized for about 20 million years, before another massive extinction event comes along and screws everything up. This extinction event wasn't nearly as bad as the Great Dying, or even the Permian-Triassic extinction, but it's a mass extinction. It was still devastating, particularly to life in the oceans. It isn't really well understood what might have caused this extinction, although it's postulated that it could have been caused by massive volcanic activity that literally shattered the Pangaean supercontinent and initiated the expansion of the continents that created the world map that we recognize and love today. Some species were able to pass through the extinction events entirely unfazed, their fossils displaying almost no noticeable changes or adaptations in response to all the devastation going on around them. Other species changed dramatically, while others who couldn't keep up joined the masses of species falling into extinction. Many dinosaur species, like the Aetosaurs, experienced little to no evolutionary change, as did many conifers and seed-bearing plant species that were hardy enough to endure whatever struggle it was that caused the extinction. Many Kynodonts, the mammalian ancestors, were actually radically changed by the extinction event as massive populations were wiped out in the northern regions of Pangaea. The Kynodont physiology responded much more pliably to the evolutionary pressures of the time than the archosaurs and the Aetosaurs. The archosaurs actually underwent a really kind of fascinating change. Almost all of them died out, with the exception of the lineage that would become crocodiles, as well as the Onithodira archosaurs, whose lineage would go on to produce the dinosaurs and the birds. Almost all the large amphibians were wiped out, as were many large mammal species, and a huge bulk of the life in the sea. It seems like with every mass extinction, whenever there's a major climate change or a major impactor or anything that really alters the chemistry or climate of the planet, life in the sea really takes a hard hit. Anyways, this brings us to the Jurassic period, which lasted from the extinction event about 200 million years ago up into about 145 million years ago, meaning the Jurassic lasted for just a little over 50 million years. During this time period, the supercontinent Pangaea began to break apart, forming two massive daughter continents, that of Laurasia in the north, which was composed of modern-day Europe, Asia, and North America, and the continent Gondwana in the south, composed of modern-day South America, Africa, Antarctica, and Australia. As Pangaea broke apart, its coastal borders grew, you know, it got more coastline. No longer was Pangaea a huge, impenetrable landmass, with vast expanses far from any major ocean or lake. Now that it was breaking apart, the climate-regulating effect of the oceans had a greater influence on the smaller continents of Laurasia and Gondwana. As wet wind and rain clouds could now reach more dry land, the world became like it was in the Devonian, hot and humid, choked with vegetation in the form of swamps and jungles and rainforests. The world had changed once again, 
and the crocodilomorph archosaurs, the ancestors of the crocodiles, found themselves less adapted to this new humid environment than they were to the dry heat of the Triassic. These archosaur crocs were pushed to the side by the dinosaur morphs, the dinosaurs, whose evolution would accelerate as they diverged to spread across the two new continents and fill out all the niches left open from the recent extinctions. I'll talk about the dinosaurs in more detail in a moment, but first, let me cover the developments of marine and plant life during the period. The frightening ichthyosaurs had survived the end Triassic extinction, alongside other marine reptiles like the long-necked plesiosaurs and some subgroups of crocodiles. Other marine reptiles appeared and thrived during the Jurassic, including the first turtles. Perhaps most importantly, groups of organisms like plankton experienced a population explosion where they rapidly diversified and radiated throughout the oceans. The plankton became ubiquitous in the Jurassic oceans, and their ubiquity made them a staple food source for all manner of aquatic organisms. The coral reefs continued to grow, really coming into their own as super-dense ecologies punctuating the otherwise barren ocean floors. Plants did really well during the Jurassic period, as it was much more comfortable for them now than it was in the Triassic, what with its dry air and temperature extremes across the stretches of continental land that characterized Pangaea. Now that Pangaea had broken apart and the world had become much more humid in the Jurassic, the planet's temperature was much more stable, less prone to the temperature extremes so common in the deep inland areas. The most prominent group of plants during the Jurassic were the conifers, which had spread across much of the planet in great towering forests. Beneath the tree canopies, but above their gnarled roots, the forest floor was a soft carpet of mosses and liverworts, with larger seed ferns crowding around the trees. Cycads grew in the tropical regions, developing huge leaves like the Hawaiian palm trees, while the ginkgo became widespread across the northern hemisphere. This heavily forested environment characterized the world of the Jurassic period, the world that the dinosaurs explored and dominated. Because of the dense vegetation that seemed to carpet the entire planet, this period is a veritable golden age for large herbivorous sauropods, including superpopular dinosaurs like the Brachiosaurus, the Diplodocus, and the Apatosaurus. All of these species were some of the largest organisms to ever walk across the surface of the Earth. Their legs were like massive tree trunks, their torsos thick and heavy. They possessed freakishly long tails, just heavy columns of bone and muscle meant to counterbalance their equally freakishly long necks. These dinosaurs had massive necks, which allowed them to raise their head nearly 30 feet off the ground to reach the leaves on the tallest trees. As herds of these titanic brachiosaurs or diplodocus roamed across the Jurassic savannas, they were complemented by other, smaller dinosaurs, like the herbivorous stegosaurus and the omnivorous ankylosaurus. It's kind of odd to call these dinosaurs small. I mean, they were certainly smaller than brachiosaurus and apatosaurus, but they weren't small by our standards. Both the stegosaurus and the ankylosaurus were 2 to 4 meters long, and they were hugely bulky. They were animals the size of cars. Numerous other species of small dinosaurs lived during this time as well, species like the turkey-sized Compsognathus, the Microraptors, and the so-called ostrich dinosaurs. These smaller creatures scurried along in the underbrush, grazing on plants or hunting small mammals or fish while avoiding being killed by their own predators, or by getting crushed under the foot of other massive dinosaurs walking around. It should go without saying that the massive dinosaurs didn't just include all the peaceful herbivores like the Brachiosaurus and the Stegosaurus. There was also the larger carnivorous species of theropods, the wild beasts of nightmare, the iconic thunder lizards that took the role as the big bad monster in most of the Jurassic Park movies. These theropod predators include the Allosaurs and the Torvosaurs, each one a towering bipedal machine of muscle and death. They all possessed really powerful hind legs for sprinting after their prey, and they had muscle-bound tails that were used both as weapons and as counterbalances. And perhaps most iconic, the massive predatory skulls, whose characteristic shape can invoke a primal fear in our minds today, even millions of years after they've all died out. These carnivorous theropods would chase down their prey, smashing into them with their huge bulk and biting them with their massive vice-like jaws. These dinosaurs had relatively small arms, which were relatively useless at catching prey. Instead, these shrimpy little arms were most likely used as stabilizing tools. During mating, the arms would be used to hold onto the other individual just for physical support. 
and during feeding, the arms would hold and restrain a prey animal that had already been caught, but still lived and struggled in its attempt to escape. Near the end of the Jurassic period, the first protobirds began to appear. Dinosaurs like the Stegosaurus and the Allosaurus belonged to a group called the Ornithischian Dinosaurs, and from this group evolved the lineages that would become the birds. The most prominent of these protobirds is the Archaeopteryx, which is a classic and famous example of a transitional species, a species that existed somewhere in between the evolutionary history of their dinosaur ancestors and their contemporary bird descendants. The Archaeopteryx had primitive feathers, which led paleontologists and evolutionary biologists to theorize that many other dinosaur species, like the Velociraptor and the Allosaurus, might also have had some kind of feathering. These feathers on the proto-birds enabled a basic ability to fly, which opened up the treetops, unreachable cliff sides, and even the sky itself as a viable habitat. Natural selection pushed the proto-birds into this available niche, sculpting them to be more efficient flyers, with streamlined feathers and an aerodynamic body plan. But all this evolutionary development didn't happen at once. The proto-birds emerged at the late Jurassic, and they radiated outwards to diverge into hundreds of new species during the Cretaceous. The Cretaceous period itself lasted from 145 million years ago up until the famous KT extinction event 66 million years ago. During the 80 million year stretch of time that makes up the Cretaceous, the continents continued to break up and move apart. Gondwana, the southern continent in the Jurassic period, split up as pieces broke off the mainland and drifted away. A large piece of land broke off from the west side and drifted away to become South America. Another chunk broke off the southeast and became Australia. A large mass of land on South Gondwana broke off and slowly drifted to the South Pole, where it would become Antarctica. In the north, the Laurentia supercontinent was ripped apart as the northwestern land masses drifted further west, creating North America and Europe. So it's pretty interesting. Our first period was dry and very hot, characterized by deserts. Our second period was humid and warm, characterized by swamps and expansive jungle. And the third period, the Cretaceous, follows this cooling trend even more, and you see more glaciation and more snow, but you also have more volcanism coming up too, and that provides a little bit of residual heat so the world doesn't just totally freeze over. And so during this period, during the Cretaceous, the world saw the emergence of angiosperms, or the flowering plants, which co-evolved with other recently emerged arthropod groups, like the bees and the wasps. Conifers and other gymnosperm plants remained the dominant vegetable groups on the planets for most of the Cretaceous, but they began to fade during the later stages of the period. Flowering plants had become more and more ubiquitous as the Cretaceous went on, and their co-evolution with pollinating insects gave them an edge over their seed-bearing cousins. In the Cretaceous oceans, the ichthyosaurs persisted. These sea monsters continued to prowl through the Mesozoic oceans, up until about 92 million years ago. It was around this time that the vast bulk of them were wiped out by a massive anoxic event, and it's hypothesized that this was caused by some kind of geologic process, like the eruption of an undersea volcano, which would have led to the depletion of oxygen levels in the ocean water. Naturally, these conditions weren't very favorable to many other marine species, and so the ichthyosaurs were wiped out alongside many other aquatic creatures. Like every extinction before them, when some species die out, they leave open their ecological niches to be filled by some new species, and the extinction of the ichthyosaurs was no different. In their absence, the sharks became the dominant predators in the oceans, and massive taxonomic groups like the stingrays and the ray-finned fishes became abundant. These ray-finned fishes in particular were a highly plastic group, quickly adapting to a huge variety of habitats and environments. The emergent genetic and phenotypic variety of the ray-finned fishes made them kind of like an evolutionary Play-Doh. They adapted to almost any aquatic environment, developing unique morphologies that turned the entire taxonomic group into an organic smorgasbord of different colors and shapes. The vast, vast majority of fish in our oceans are ray-finned fishes, so the Cretaceous is the period where the primordial oceans began to look like uh, kind of how they do today. On dry land, the archosaurian reptiles like the crocodiles and the dinosaurs continued to dominate. Much like the fish in the sea, the reptiles on the land enjoyed a high degree of genetic and phenotypic diversity. The famous Tyrannosaurus rex existed during this time, as did other iconic dinosaurs like the Triceratops, the Velociraptors, and the Pterosaurs. The pterosaurs were a group of dinosaurs that could fly on their massive wings. 
They had emerged in the mid-Triassic, and they became increasingly common during the Jurassic, until they seemed endemic during the Cretaceous. Much like the fish in the sea and the reptiles on the land, the reptiles in the air also considered the Cretaceous to be their golden age, although near the end of this period they started to die out for unknown reasons. The land and the skies were also shared by insects, who also enjoyed relatively high diversity and evolutionary success during this period as well. Insect groups like ants, bees, aphids, and locusts, among several other major groups, all appeared and radiated, becoming commonplace and diverse in their own right. These creatures and climates defined the Cretaceous period for its entire 80 million year duration. Biodiversity was high as animals and plants spread out and diversified to fill all of the available niches left open by the small extinctions here and there that tended to dot the era. As the Cretaceous dragged on, this biodiversity slowly declined. As the temperature cooled, many species of reptile, particularly the pterosaurs, became less and less common, with many lineages dying out entirely. This slow decline was interrupted by the end Cretaceous extinction event, which has been discussed in schools and books, on science shows, on TV and YouTube. Basically, anywhere people talk about dinosaurs, they also talk about the end Cretaceous extinction. This event totally resurfaced the Earth in much the same way that the Permian Cretaceous extinction event did. Huge portions of Earth's life were destroyed forever, consumed in a rapid and devastating shift in the planetary climate. So what was this event? You know, what happened? 66 million years ago, it's believed that a massive impactor, nearly 10 kilometers wide, struck the Earth with a hellacious force. This collision threw millions of tons of rock and debris into the air, and it choked the planet in a thick layer of dust. The light of the sun was blocked out, and temperatures dropped substantially. Plants starved and died, which subsequently led to the starvation of many herbivore species that had managed to survive the initial impact. As all things in nature exist in an ecological relationship with everything else, the death of the plants, followed by the death of the herbivores, led to the widespread death of many carnivore species who relied on the herbivores for food. Species like the Tyrannosaurus rex, the Stegosaurus, the Mosasaurus, and the Ammonites, along with thousands and thousands of others, were all wiped out in this cataclysm, in the geologic blink of an eye. It was truly a dinosaur apocalypse. No, not just that, it was, it was a total apocalypse for all life, as all the large creatures simply couldn't handle the cold temperatures and the lack of vegetation. In fact, most creatures just couldn't handle this, and most strict herbivores and carnivores just died out. The animals that happened to persevere through this hellish time were the omnivores, the scavengers, those who could eat the dead and rotting flesh of plants and animals. The crocodiles survived because they're super badass. I'm, I'm kidding. The, I mean, they are badass, but the crocodiles survived because they could go into a kind of limited hibernation, and their young grew slowly and fed off of the remains of other animals. The canadonts were able to survive because of their relatively small size and their fur which kept them warm, as well as numerous other adaptations that they had acquired while hunting in the undergrowth, in the shadow of the dinosaurs. These adaptations carried the canadonts through the KT extinction event, where they would go and diversify into modern mammals in the Cenozoic era, although I'll get into more detail on that in the next episode. That's about it for this one. Uh, I, I hope you guys enjoyed this walk through the Mesozoic era. And if you've been listening to the whole playlist on the evolutionary history of life on Earth, I hope you've been enjoying the whole journey so far. Next episode, I'll be discussing the recent but relatively brief Cenozoic era, so be sure to tune in and check it out. As always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.